Hey guys, what's up and welcome back to the Rocket Shop. My name is Philip and today we're going to continue a little two-parters adventure into the world of rocket fuels. This is part two of this series, so if you haven't seen part one, go watch it because much of this video is building upon the basics outlaid in part one. As always, the video is broken up into chapters with the timestamps on screen right now. With that said, let's start. In the next few years, there will be a deep going change in the spaceflight industry. No, for once I'm not talking about reusable rockets. A change that is more hard to see and invisible to the untrained eye. The change is a switch in the preferred rocket fuels used to bring both cargo and people to orbit. Throughout pretty much all of spaceflight history, the propellants used to get the rocket into space were pretty much the only thing that didn't change much. Kerosene, alcohols, hydrogen and a few hypergolics here and there are about every type of liquid rocket propellant ever used. But now, in the 21st century, a new contender has arrived. Methane. A tiny molecule normally known as an atmospheric pollutant and greenhouse gas, methane may be a blessing for the spaceflight industry. Most upcoming vehicles with good chances to actually see flight are designed to run on this rather newly discovered rocket fuel. And since even the big players like SpaceX, United Launch Alliance, ESA and Rocket Lab are switching to methane for their future orbital launch vehicles, there has to be a tremendous advantage to using methane instead of all the other fuels out there. In this video, we will analyze what makes methane so attractive for these companies and why it is probably the rocket fuel of the future. First described in 1776 and later named in 1866, the inconspicuous molecule of methane has been hidden beneath the radar of spaceflight engineers for decades. Known mainly as a byproduct of agriculture and a greenhouse gas, methane generally hasn't got the best reputation of all the gases out there. But since it is a main component of natural gas, Methane has been used as fuel for ovens, heaters, electricity generators and lately even ships and cars, but never before in rockets. Methane is an organic compound molecule that is made up of a central carbon atom bonded with four equally spaced hydrogen atoms. It therefore classifies as a hydrocarbon or, more specifically, an alkane, of which it is the simplest. Due to its chemical characteristics, methane appears as a colorless gas at room temperatures. Methane can be found abundantly on planet Earth, mainly at and beneath the seafloor and together with oil underground, but small quantities can also be found in our atmosphere. In other words, methane is already quite well known for the fact that it has never powered a rocket before. In part 1 of the series, we outlined a series of criteria to evaluate rocket fuels. Since we have done that already, I won't explain why we need each and every criteria and how exactly it is derived. If you need a refresh on your knowledge of that, just go back to part 1 and rewatch that section about rocket fuel requirements. Anyway, let's evaluate methane using these 9 factors to get ourselves a picture of what methane is capable of. Firstly, and maybe even most important, is the maximum specific impulse a rocket fuel can deliver. For methane, the maximum theoretical ISP lies at 459 seconds. A quick reminder, this value can never be achieved in reality because we are assuming a perfect combustion with no losses for this value, something that is just physically impossible. A typical engine won't achieve much more than about 80% of this number. Second is the fuel density and burn ratio, two factors that are connected for various reasons. 
They both decide how much the dry mass of the rocket is going to increase due to the volume of the fuel that we have to stuff into tanks to get to orbit. Methane has a density of 0.657 grams per liter in gaseous state and at room temperature. However, since liquid roll propellants, as the name already tells, are stored as a liquid to maximize the amount of fuel we can cram into our fuel tanks, the density of methane will be a lot lower in a rocket's fuel tank. So the real deal isn't the density at room temperature, but the density as a liquid, and for methane, this value lies at 422.8 kg per cubic meter. If you paid enough attention during part 1, you will already see how different methane actually is from hydrogen. But density alone doesn't affect a whole lot in terms of physical stats. We need to consider the burn ratio to get a perspective. Liquid methane, which is normally combusted with liquid oxygen, has a fuel oxidizer burn ratio of 3.7 to 1, meaning we will need 3.7 units of methane to combust one unit of oxygen in our engines. Next up are all the different temperatures that we have to consider when evaluating a rocket fuel. These are the rocket fuel's melting and boiling point, both defining the storage temperature and the combustion temperature inside the engine. To be in a liquid state, the substance has to be kept at a temperature between its melting and boiling point. For methane, the melting point is at negative 182.4 degrees Celsius or 90 Kelvin and the boiling point at negative 161.5 degrees Celsius or 111.6 Kelvin, making methane a cryogenic fuel. This window of storage temperature has a neat side effect which we will take a closer look at in a later chapter, so keep these numbers in mind. As for the combustion temperature, methane and liquid oxygen generate 3550 Kelvin when combusted together. However, these torturing temperatures aren't fully induced into the engines as thermodynamics is actually our friend in this case. So, now we're getting into the non-numerical factors, so bear in mind, there is some interpretation needed to make proper sense of them. First is the one thing it has some sort of a value, although a pretty variable one, and that is fuel cost. Sadly though, there is almost no information on how much rocket grade methane costs out there since almost no one is purchasing it as of now. All of what I know is a rough calculation based on the prices of liquid natural gas that delivers us a value of about a half a dollar per kilogram with some uncertainty. In terms of combustion products, methane keeps it relatively simple. Since it is made up exclusively of carbon and hydrogen, one molecule of methane burns together with three molecules of oxygen to create two molecules of water and one of carbon dioxide. And that's basically all that comes out of the engines of a methane-powered rocket, besides the few nitrogen oxides that always appear when something hot comes into contact with air. Not only are the negative environmental effects of these two combustion products limited to greenhouse gases, but they are also quite well suited for usability since there aren't any aggressive engine-eating substances or so generated. So these are the chemical and physical properties of methane. But numbers don't paint a picture. To solve the equation of why methane is the rocket fuel of the future, we need to make sense of bare stats. And what's better to get an overview than to directly compare methane to other rocket fuels in the same categories? Well, there isn't really. And that is why we're going to do exactly that. Getting an overview on all the different rocket fuels out there certainly isn't easy. Luckily, we can narrow our comparison down quite a bit by what we know already. Firstly, we're using the same categories that we've used to evaluate methane to compare methane to other fuels. Secondly, this video is only considering liquid-liquid propellant mixtures, so both solid fuels and hybrid propellants are ruled out, since I have already dedicated a whole another video on this topic. And lastly, we are concentrating on the three most commonly used rocket fuels as of today and methane, limiting our comparison to four competitors. 
These four competitors are kerosene and hydrogen, both combusted together with liquid oxygen, UDMH, a variation of hydrazine that combusts together with nitrogen tetroxide, and of course methane, also burning with liquid oxygen. Luckily, we already have all the properties of methane, so we can just fill them in right now. The only missing things are the values for the three other fuels. In our first category, the maximum theoretical specific impulse, the hypergolic UDMH gets the worst value with just 333 seconds, tightly followed by RP1 with 370 seconds. As we learned in part 1, hydrogen is actually the untouchable king here with over 530 seconds of specific impulse, absolutely crushing the rest. As you can see, methane is, despite not being as efficient as hydrogen, still an incredibly good rocket fuel. But keep in mind, the specific impulse accessible to Methalox engine is low, limited to lower values. Current engines, such as the SpaceX Raptor, max out at about 380 seconds of specific impulse. Next up is density and the closely related burn ratio. As we know, methane has a density of 422.8 kg per cubic meter in liquid state, which is the unit we are going to use for all the other fuels as well. UDMH actually has the highest density of these fuels, with an astonishing 791 kg per cubic meter, almost twice the density of methane. Then there's kerosene, which, depending on the temperature it is stored at, reaches a density between 810 and 1002 kg per cubic meter, which is the highest value of all liquid rocket fuels. On the other side of the scale, there stands hydrogen, with a density of just 70.85 kg per cubic meter, not even one tenth of RP1 and, as discussed in part 1, the lowest possible density of all known liquids. But as we know, the density alone doesn't do too much. The combination of it together with the burn ratio is the real deal. So what about that? We already know that methane burns together with liquid oxygen at a ratio of 3.7 to 1. UDMH and kerosene combusting together with their respective oxidizers of nitrogen tetroxide and liquid oxygen have almost the same burn ratio at 2.61 and 2.7 to 1. And then there's our good friend hydrogen rocking its burn ratio of 6 to 1. Again, methane's density burn ratio combination is located somewhere close to the middle of the chart. Next up are storage temperatures. To reduce the amount of data, we can combine melting and boiling points into a temperature window here. Therefore, this window stretches from minus 182.4 to minus 181.5 degrees Celsius for methane. Kerosene, therefore, has a storage window of minus 43 to 150 degrees Celsius. UDMH stays liquid between minus 57 and 64 degrees and hydrogen again takes it to the extreme with a storage temperature between negative 252 and negative 259 degrees. Not only does methane have a wide range of temperature conditions at which it stays liquid, the lower end of its window approaching negative 182.4 degrees Celsius it also has a neat side effect, but more on that later. Apart from storage temperatures, the combustion temperature is also important. The heat created by the fuel combustion is critical for engine design after all. The lowest combustion temperature actually has hydrogen with only 3070 Kelvin. And that's still hot enough to melt just about anything, yet still the coolest combusting rocket fuel. Next is UDMH with 3415 Kelvin, tightly followed by our friend methane. The highest combustion temperature has kerosene, which burns at a whopping 3670 Kelvin. Until now, all of our candidates have shown vastly different performances in the individual categories. But regarding methane, there is some sort of a pattern. If we rank every fuel in each category, we can see pretty clearly that while the others shuffle their positions around, methane is always somewhere in the middle. However, the not so physical categories is where methane unveils its full potential. 
First up in these categories is price. Sadly, as we know, we don't really know the price of rocket-grade liquid methane since almost nobody uses it as of now, and the few people who use it have not revealed how much they're paying for it. Our assumed value of $0.5 per kilogram is likely a bit too high since prices will inevitably drop down when more and more launch vehicles are starting to use it and sales go up. For now, we are going to have to assume that methane might be a bit more expensive. However, the cost for the other fuels is well known. Hydrogen comes in at a price of $3.66 per kilogram and kerosene at about $25 per kilogram. Our last fuel, UDMH, hasn't seen a lot of use in the West for a pretty long time. Therefore, I only could find a number of $24 per kilogram, but that was in 1980. Since then, the US dollar has lost a lot of value through inflation, 361% in fact. If UDMH cost NASA $24 per kilogram in 1980, it would cost at least $86 today, disregarding any other factor than inflation, making it by far the most expensive fuel on our list. And lastly, we have environmental impact and suitability for use on reusable rockets. For combustion products, we assume that every fuel is burnt with their standard oxidizer, liquid oxygen for hydrogen, methane and kerosene, and nitrogen tetroxide for UDMH. As we already know, methane burns pretty clean and only creates water vapor and a bit of carbon dioxide. Hydrogen manages to be even more environmentally friendly by emitting what is basically 100% water vapor. Sadly, that can't be said about UDMH, which reacts upon contact with nitrogen and tetroxide to produce CO2, water vapor and sulfuric compounds as well as large amounts of nitrogen oxide. And at last, there's RP1, a carbon-based fossil fuel, which burns to carbon dioxide and water vapor, but creates all sorts of sulfuric compounds and a lot of soot in the process. In terms of engine reusability, hydrogen and methane are both incredibly good candidates. They burn relatively cool and do not create any damaging combustion products, although hydrogen really loves to mess around with some materials. RP1 is also quite a good option for reuse, but the soot created by its combustion does in fact hinder its potential for reuse a little bit. However, as SpaceX has successfully demonstrated, there is ways around that. Lastly, there is UDMH and that has got a lot of problems in terms of reusing engines burning this fuel. Since UDMH slash nitrogen tetroxide is a hypergolic mixture, there always is a risk for explosions and at last, these two fluids are toxic as hell. So while it may be possible, reusing UDMH engines isn't the best idea in the world. So these are the stats for these four fuels in our nine categories. Quite a lot of numbers that we need to interpret correctly. To get us a full picture of how methane truly compares to the three other fuels, I have colored them as in how they perform in each category. Green is the best fuel in the category, red the worst, and the yellows are somewhere in between. As you can see, some candidates such as hydrogen and RP1 are jumping around from best to worst and back. Methane, however, is either located between the two extremes or at the upper end of the scale. The same thing, however, can be stated about UDMH, but this stuff is incredibly dangerous and extremely toxic, meaning probably we should leave our fingers off UDMH for future rockets. Other than hydrogen, UDMH and kerosene, methane has no obvious flaws, such as hydrogen's low density or kerosene's coking problems. Despite almost always being outperformed by some other fuel, methane is the best compromise between all the different categories. But what makes methane really stand out is our very last factor, rocket reusability. Methane is, other than our comparison may suggest, not just well suited for usable rockets, it is in fact the ideal fuel for such vehicles.
ever since the very beginning of spaceflight. The dream of being able to fly the same rocket multiple times has sparked the imagination of engineers. Yet it has taken almost 70 years until reusable rockets are beginning to take over. And that has actually got a lot to do with the use of methane as a rocket fuel. For decades, the most commonly used rocket fuels were hydrogen and kerosene, and both have their complications when it comes to rocket reusability. Kerosene isn't friendly to rocket engines, since the soot generated by combustion often gets stuck inside the engine, meaning vital parts can get obstructed and damage inside the engine occurs. And hydrogen is just too undense for reusable rockets, since the enormous tanks required for hydrogen increase the dry mass of the rocket so much that landing it just eats up way too much fuel. Methane, however, hasn't got either of these problems. Just how well suited a rocket fuel is for reuse can't really be packaged into numbers. While the physical and chemical properties of a fuel certainly have an impact on it, what really decides whether a fuel is good for usable rockets or not is its real-world characteristics and required engineering solutions to accommodate the fuel's needs. And that is where methane has some serious advantage over almost every other rocket fuel. One of these directly originates from methane storage temperatures and that neat side effect that I mentioned earlier. Since the tanks of both oxidizer and fuel have to be fitted within the same rocket, engineers usually just build two separate tanks and stack them on top of each other with the, some space between. And that is required because oxygen stays liquid at temperatures between minus 218 and minus 182.9 degrees Celsius. Since most rocket fuels have a vastly different storage temperature, both tanks have to be isolated from each other to avoid the heat exchange between the two fluids. That has always been the case. But methane is a little bit different here. The lower end of its storage temperature window is only separated from the higher end of the window for oxygen by 0.5 degrees, meaning it is possible to use the same tank wall for both tanks. This so-called common dome design allows for great reduction in vehicle dry mass, which turns out extremely nice for the total amount of fuel needed to get to orbit, and also for the amount of rocket fuel needed to get a rocket back to Earth for use. This design, however, is only possible when using methane and liquid oxygen. Methane is also excellent for long-term storage and easy handling, both on the ground and in space. Due to its relatively high density, low reactivity and again manageable temperatures, methane can be stored pretty much indefinitely, just doesn't take up too much space and doesn't leak out at every chance it gets. Not only does that mean that loading methane into a rocket is just as easy as with kerosene, it also enables deep space missions and reusability since we don't have to worry too much about our fuel eating up the tanks or leaking out. Additionally, these long-term storage capabilities make orbital refueling way easier since, again, the risk of fuel escaping the system is low. Orbital refueling is essential for deep space missions as well as the idea of second stage reusability. If we can just refuel a vehicle with the propellant needed to get back to Earth while it is in space, we require less fuel to get into orbit since we don't have to carry our fuel for the return journey with us the whole time, which in fact increases our possible payload mass by a lot. So methane is great for reducing takeoff mass and long-term storage both in on the ground and in space. But there are even more reasons why methane is so good for usable rockets. Other than most other fuels, Methane isn't that hard to produce and abundantly available. Methane can be extracted from natural gas, filtered out of the air or simply be produced through chemical reactions such as the Sabatier process. We basically only need some electrical energy to create a basically infinite supply of relatively cheap rocket fuel, something that comes in more than handy when trying to reach full rocket reusability. After all, Reusing a rocket just isn't worth the effort if the fuel alone costs too much. Methane therefore makes reusable rockets more economical than most other fuels. 
Additionally, methane can be produced entirely emission-free, since we only need electricity to split water and carbon dioxide and rearrange the atoms. That means a fully reusable methane-fueled vehicle could in fact fly 100% emission neutral, which is huge for the image of spaceflight in a world increasingly concerned with climate change and environmental protection. And these are only a few reasons of why rocket reusability and methane go hand in hand with each other. Of course, reusing rockets running on different fuels is possible, but methane just has a lot of advantageous properties for that. And of course, the immense potential of methane as a rocket fuel hasn't been unnoticed by the space industry at all. As of the making of this video, only one methane-powered vehicle has made it to orbit yet, but that is just about to change. There is a series of launch vehicles in development or even already in prototype testing that run on methane. Probably the most famous of these is, how else could it be, the SpaceX Starship. Pretty much the pioneer of using methane as rocket fuel, Starship is one of just three methane-powered vehicles to see flight so far, if only suborbital. The call to use methane as Starship's fuel came a bit surprising for many, but SpaceX had their very own reasons for it. Said to be fully and rapidly reusable, the Starship Super Heavy system takes benefit of the properties methane offers in terms of vehicle usability. Furthermore, Starship is also set to take advantage of orbital refueling, meeting up with other Starships to refuel for deep space missions. But other than that, SpaceX plans to send Starship to Mars. Getting people to Mars isn't the biggest challenge here. Build a rocket large enough, refuel it in orbit, do the transfer and land it on the surface. But in order to bring our passengers back to Earth, we need a lot of additional fuel. Bringing that all with us isn't really an option since that would mean our rocket would have to be more than double the size or sending dozens of expandable tankers to Mars, which itself is pretty complicated, even disregarding the complications of refueling on the surface of Mars. So SpaceX were looking for a fuel that could easily be produced on Mars using in-situ resource utilization or ISRU. Both ingredients needed to make methane water and carbon dioxide, are abundant on Mars in form of ice and gas in the atmosphere. What really gave methane the edge over any other fuel for SpaceX is manufacturability on Mars. But other launch providers are switching to methane as well, even if they aren't aiming as far as SpaceX does. Most other companies and organizations are taking advantage of methane's pure performance and some of its reusability enabling capabilities. Currently, there are three reusable methane-powered vehicles in development. Although still at least three or four years away, there is a chance all of them could make it into service. The most conventional of these three systems is Blue Origin's New Glenn. In development for well over 10 years by now, New Glenn has yet to even be fully assembled for a first time and has been delayed for years already, making it questionable for some whether it will ever even fly. Regardless, New Glenn would, once operational, run its first stage entirely on methane and, as of now, become the second largest methane-powered rocket with a total height of 95 meters. Blue Origin also plans to use the first stage of New Glenn and seems to be developing a reusable second stage as well, but we know almost nothing about it except for it being called Project Jarvis. Knowing Blue Origin, this upgraded upper stage won't make it into service before 2035 anyway. The next vehicle to set to run on methane is Rocket Lab's Neutron Launcher. Only half the size of New Glenn, Neutron will be propelled by nine methane-burning Archimedes engines and will also be partially reusable. However, Neutron is far more advanced than New Glenn. It's actually entirely made from carbon fibers makes use of 3D printing and features an unusual design. Neutron's hull is held in an irregular shape, giving it better re-entry characteristics. 
It also features permanently attached fairings that split up upon stage separation and a second stage that is placed inside the interstage which flies out of the open fairing on stage separation. Through its truly weird design, Rocket Lab hopes to make Neutron as efficient as possible and utilize methane's properties for easy reuse of Neutron. And then there is relativity space. Other than most on this list, they are actually already planning two different methane-powered vehicles as of now. Well, it turns out, not anymore. The first rocket of the company, Terran 1, has already conducted its first orbital launch. But sadly, it didn't reach space. Due to already being far along in development of their second launcher, Relativity Space actually cancelled Terran 1 after just a single semi-successful launch. Terran 1 was said to be a small set launcher and therefore much smaller than many other methane-powered rockets. But Relativity Space has a second methane-powered vehicle in the works, which is called Terran R and is set to fly in no earlier than 2025. I have to admit, this thing looks a little bit like a miniature starship and I kinda like it. Terran R will be a partially and later even maybe fully reusable medium lift launch vehicle that will use methane on both stages. Additionally, the rocket's body is in large parts 3D printed and designed using complex shapes and structures to enhance vehicle performance, such as this shell-shaped tank dome. However, the first and as of now only methane-powered rocket to reach orbit is actually the Chinese land space Zhukui-2 with its gas generator Tianche-12 engine. Sorry for totally mispronouncing that, I don't speak Chinese. Sadly, we don't really know a lot about this vehicle, other than it having a payload capacity of around 2 tons and having conducted one failed launch attempt and one successful launch so far. Since methane isn't just good for usability, but also performs quite well as an ascent-only rocket fuel, there even are some expendable rockets in development that run on methane. Probably the most prominent one of these is ULA's Vulcan Launcher that is set to succeed the legendary Atlas and Delta rocket families. Vulcan is actually powered by Blue Origin's BE4 engine, which is the same engine used on the first stage of New Glenn. But Vulcan only possesses two instead of seven of these engines on the first stage. Although ULA has got plans to reuse its engines through their smart reuse ideas, but these plans only aim at the two engines and their avionics and likely won't be ready before 2030. Additionally, there are some smaller startup enterprises that are currently designing a variety of small set launch vehicles running on liquid natural gas instead of methane. While technically not as ideal as purified liquid methane, natural gas certainly offers only slightly worse performance for a significantly lower price. But all of these are being developed by a start by unproven startup companies, meaning the likelihood of any of these vehicles actually entering service isn't the highest of all. As you can see, there's quite a variety of rockets under development and soon flight testing set to run on methane as rocket fuel. Considering that methane still hasn't seen use on any other rockets apart from SpaceX's Starship, Terran 1 and one Chinese vehicle, the space industry has to have a lot of faith in methane. In the end, it seems like there is no real downside to using methane as a rocket fuel other than it being unproven in orbital rockets. But the raw performance advantages it offers seem to have convinced the whole space light industry that methane is in fact the fuel of the future. Despite being a rather inconspicuous fuel option for decades, methane performs pretty consistent across all possible factors and that can be used to evaluate rocket fuels which sets it apart from pretty much every other fuel. And especially since the industry is shifting more and more towards reusable rockets, methane's advantages are becoming more attractive than ever before. We are soon going to see many different methane-powered rockets take to the skies. So many, in fact, 
that we could see methane become the most commonly used rocket fuel in just a few short years. Never before had there been such a dramatic shift in rocket design, at least since Apollo. And for many reasons, it is fair to assume that this trend will continue after the first wave of methane-powered rockets enter service. It seems like methane is indeed the rocket fuel of the future. And that's it for my two-part video series on rocket fuel. Leave a comment below what you think is the rocket fuel of the future and if you enjoyed the video, which I really hope you did, why don't you hit the like button and subscribe to Rocket Up. I really appreciate your support. We see ourselves in the next video and until then, I'm out. Cheers!